This is the number of Dreamcasts sold over the short life of the platform. The system was quite popular with an abundant amount of quality games. It was Sega's final attempt to achieve their dream of pure market dominance, one they never fully realized. Sega had tasted success in the consumer market, but it was always fleeting and limited in scope. The Sega Genesis was very profitable and popular in a number of countries, but failed to gain traction in Japan, selling less units than the PC Engine. The Saturn was also profitable and extremely popular in Japan, giving Sega their first and only home console success story in the homeland, but the Saturn flatlined everywhere else. Failing in most regions while succeeding in one had become something of a trend with the company. With all faults and successes considered, Sega intended for the Dreamcast to be a return to form, a system with a marketing strategy designed to bring home worldwide success for the first time in Sega's consumer market division. Yet after only a couple of years, Sega was facing bankruptcy. The Dreamcast had failed, and Sega would exit the home hardware business. So what exactly happened? This is Retro Impressions. Did piracy kill the Dreamcast? The reason for many seems obvious. It was piracy, right? Surely bootleg games and diminished sales were the main contributing factor that the Dreamcast never caught fire, eventually putting Sega out of the home hardware business. It's a valid train of thought with conventional thinking going like this. The Dreamcast was produced in an era where cheap optical drives capable of burning discs were available to the public in mass. With the Dreamcast cracked early on, an overwhelming number of consumers chose to deal in pirated games rather than purchasing them. The lack and loss of these game sales in turn tanked the Dreamcast and Sega. Now admittedly, this was an issue though not isolated to the Dreamcast. In 1999, when visiting family in Mexico City, I took my PSX to an underground mod shop which installed the MM3 chip, allowing it to play burned games. I purchased 100 games for a dollar each and was on my way back to Oregon a month later. I'm not sure this impacted my purchase of any game I wanted, as these were all games I was on the fence about or had never heard of, such as Pepsi Man, a game never sold in North America. Furthermore, I live in America where the internet speeds remain some of the worst in the world, and in 99, good luck downloading a game unless you had days to dedicate to that task alone. In 1999, only 26% of households had internet, with the average connection being through a dial-up 56k modem, a speed requiring multiple days of continuous connection to achieve a download, a connection that required dedicated use of most households' only phone line. Coincidentally, this is also the modem speed contained in the Dreamcast. If having a slow internet connection wasn't enough, you also needed to understand how FTP worked and be plugged into an underground community distributing this stuff to access such a resource. Even with apps such as BearShare and LimeWire, there was no guarantee that the file you spent the weekend downloading was indeed the file that you were after. When the Dreamcast released in 1998, Sega experienced its first financial loss since becoming a publicly traded company. Like the Saturn before it, the console was costly to manufacture and was sold at a loss. In addition, the Dreamcast cost a substantial amount more to develop than any other system in Sega's past. More on that in a moment though. The home console released in Japan for 29,800 yen. Although we don't know how much the hardware cost to manufacture, we can estimate based on prior Sega systems launch. It was approximately $100 more than its launch price or 350 US dollars to assemble the components and place them into a retail package. Tracking sales figures of consoles sold against software attach rates is fairly revealing. Hideki Seda, who was president of Sega and designed nearly all their consumer hardware, has stated that Sega needed a 5-game attach rate before a new console started to turn a profit. This of course didn't account for a platform's development, administration, or other operating expenses, only the cost to manufacture and deliver a unit to retail stores. So why did Sega find this to be an acceptable attach rate? I think you'll find it's embedded in market research and trends. If a system could find success and hold out long enough, the cost of manufacture could be reduced down to the point that the hardware itself was profitable even before the consumer purchased their first game. This profit, in turn, could be used to develop the next hardware in line. So game development needed to pay for itself, software sold eventually was the main profit realized for a specific console, and that profit was folded into the next venture. If 5 games was the break-even mark for Sega, how realistic was that? While we rarely have year-by-year -year breakdowns for most home systems, we do have some solid numbers. 
all Nintendo home systems achieved a lifetime attach rate of over 6 to 1 with the N64, coming in the lowest at just under 7. The GameCube attained an incredible 9.59 to 1, the PS2 had a total attach rate of under 7, which may be attributed to those who purchased the system for the DVD player. However, it's not out of line with other examples we have. So it may be fair to state that the DVD capabilities influenced the game systems consumers chose to purchase rather than directly influencing a measurable percentage of consumers only purchasing hardware for their playback purposes. The PSX is a phenom, having an end life attach rate of 9.38 to 1, about on par with the Wii, although less than the GameCube. How accurate of a picture does this paint? Well, it depends on the system, and though most numbers available for system sales only reflect the hardware at the end of life, we do have glimpses into the midlife of some notable examples. Midlife examples are important for one reason. The data we have access to shows that the longer a system is available and supported, the larger the attach rate becomes, and more importantly, hitting that breakeven point is typically a long game strategy. Without reflecting on this trend, the end life numbers paint a less than clear picture of the struggles a company might face during the hardware's most critical years. First up, let's look at the Saturn. The end life shows 10 units attached for every console sold. Though at the start of 98, we see an attach rate that's hovering around 9 to 1. The PlayStation is about the same, with the start of 98 showing it hovering at 7 to 1. It's not uncommon to see these numbers start small and start to grow as more software releases over a console's lifespan, or as hardware sales wrap up and the market share of a system lends favor to continued releases on the platform, a fact that makes weathering the initial unprofitable years of a console's launch critical in realizing profit down the road. This is one reason that even though the Saturn wasn't a smashing success, it still turned a profit. The Dreamcast, much like the Saturn before it, met a few major hurdles, starting with a disastrous launch in Japan. Sega had 500,000 pre-orders, but due to production issues with the graphical chipsets provided by NEC, only 150,000 units would be manufactured and shipped in all of 98. Bernie Stolar came on board Sega of America in 97 dropping a bombshell at E3 when he announced the Saturn was not Sega's future. As he would later state, I felt the Saturn was hurting the company more than helping it. This was a battle we weren't going to win. Sega had indeed planned to wind the system down in anticipation of the Dreamcast, but with this one mind, retailers considered the system dead in America, leaving Sega without a presence on store shelves for all of 98 and most of 99, wiping away their critical and highly profitable royalty revenue stream. At E3 the following year, Stellar again made an announcement, going directly against the sales plan Sega had laid out. Sega intended to release the system at around $250 to stay within their 5 game to break even attach rate strategy. Stellar felt the price point was too high though, so without consulting anyone, he took to the stage and announced a new, lower price of $199, coinciding with the launch date creating the tagline $9999 for $199. The downside is this launch price required an 8 game attach rate to break even on manufacturing alone. Sega and Stellar would part ways shortly after this. The price would stick, but Stellar wouldn't be on board to see the system launch. Now, there is a catch. We don't know if the story involving Stellar going rogue is true, but appears to be some anecdotal and circumstantial evidence pointing to the likelihood that it is. It's also worth mentioning that in mid-2000, a report was released that covered a full breakdown of the hardware along with an estimate of the current cost to manufacture the system. Figures put manufacturing costs alone at $250 to $285. This is a full two years after the hardware made its debut. So this brings us back to piracy, the Dreamcast, and how the attach rate was affected overall. Looking at the data reveals something unexpected. The Dreamcast has three mostly unaffected fiscal years where software and hardware were actively marketed without obstruction to this data due to the announcement that it was being discontinued. With limited availability and exclusivity to Japan in 98, the attach rate was 3.39 to 1. 1999 saw the worldwide launch with the rate rocking the 5.6 to 1, with an attach rate growing by over 60%. 2000 marks the final year on the market with full support. 
the rate grew by 80% to 7.04, so a hair over two years on the market and the Dreamcast was selling incredible amounts of software in relation to the hardware. In comparison, after a bit over three years on the market, the PSX had an attach rate of 6.21 to 1 and would need one more year than the Dreamcast to reach a similar 7.12 to 1. The PS2 follows a slower trajectory than the PS1 and Dreamcast, reaching 5.41 in the third year and 6.71 in the fourth. Consoles such as the N64 and original Xbox never reached an attach rate of 7 or higher, so I think it's definitively clear that the Dreamcast downfall was hardly affected by piracy, and indeed, maybe the limited piracy helped Sega sell software units as determined in the European Commission's report on estimating displacement rates of copyrighted content in the EU. So if piracy wasn't the issue, what exactly happened? The answer is complicated, and one would be hard-pressed to lay blame on one thing or any corporate decision made prior to the Dreamcast. However, there's a few interesting details we can look at in addition to Sega's monumental task of holding out long enough to see enough software sales to make the platform viable. The development cost of the Dreamcast was astronomical, and most of the capital to develop and market the Dreamcast came from loans or money set aside to pay outstanding loans, so Sega started off in a bad position. To better understand why the Dreamcast was different than the prior Sega Ventures, it's important to understand the end cost. For the development of the hardware, it costs 50 to 80 million dollars. For the software development, 150 to 200 million. And for the marketing in each territory, we will spend 100 million dollars. That's huge numbers. When I was involved in the auto industry, it cost about 200 million to design the engine, chassis, everything. For the tools and dies, it cost 200 million. And to launch a new car, it cost 200 million. So that means 600 million, the same to launch this tiny machine. So $600 million to launch the Dreamcast and around $300 million to manufacture and ship the hardware. All this and Sega was still taking between a $100 and $150 loss on every unit sold depending on the region. Sega would insist that the issue was a weak Japanese economy, and while it's true it did launch during the era now known as the Lost Decade, I think the sales across all gaming hardware in Japan speak volumes against that idea here. Even if we place the loss on every console sold at $50, it's still over a billion dollars Sega needed to recoup before they started to turn a profit. In addition to this, there were other financial issues to deal with in the form of Sega's amusement operations. From 1993 through 98, Sega saw steady growth in this division, accounting for around half of Sega's net revenue year to year, with the other half coming from their consumer division. However, in 99, Sega missed the mark and amusement revenue fell by 26%. That on its own might not have impacted Sega to a great degree, but when taken in tandem with Sega having a 59% decline in consumer sales from 1997 to 1999, a shortfall almost fully attributed to Sega of America dropping the ball, Sega was in a difficult position entering the launch period of the Dreamcast and only a miracle in sales could turn it around. Another popular talking point is EA choosing not to publish games on the platform. The story here is quite interesting as Ira Majiri brought together a secret team in the United States to develop Sega's next platform to succeed the Saturn. Sato, whose team had created every consumer home console for Sega, was also working on the successor to the Saturn back in Japan. According to Sato, the America's team number one priority was cost. The number two was performance, number three was sticking to something like a schedule, the gain from each target, and they get a bonus if they're able to clear that target. That means they were applying heat. Each person gets $3,000 if they clear the cost. If they clear the next schedule, they get $2,000. And that's how they're applying priority. Therefore, the number one most important thing is to receive $3,000, $5,000, and they have to get the cost to match because of this. It's the goal they're working hard towards. Things for Ira Majuri's team looked promising, with the majority of Sega executives expecting it to be the hardware which would win out. Late into the development process, it became time for Sega to choose a path, either Ira Majuri's North American machine or Sega's internal Japanese design. As Sato recalls, there was an Imperial Council of sorts. Mr. Okawa was there, Mr. Nakayama, who I believe was vice president of the organization at the time, Mr. Ira Majuri was there as the president in addition to the development unit and sales unit. The president was already discussing various things. He called a person from development and said, as for this architecture, this one is better than what Sato is doing. He said, Sato has been failing a lot up until now. 
there is no trial that could beat Nintendo, something like that. If it's this one, there is a chance it can win. He enticed several people. A problem spot in regard to the American side was pointed out by someone in development, and they could not answer in regard to that. The person in charge of the American side couldn't, you know? And after that, the debate was getting heated. I thought it was 95% hopeless, and then a conclusion was reached. Then right at that time, a topic that I didn't know at the time came out in the debate. For some reason, the president of Sega of America received stock from the graphic house 3DFX. I thought, one of the reasons he was endorsing 3DFX was because of that? What the hell? Sega of America executives weren't alone in receiving 3DFX stock. Electronic Arts was a major shareholder as well. This is undisputedly a major reason EA refused to work with Sega going forward, though their public standpoint was the chipset Sega settled on was the worst ever created, stating, the Dreamcast became a system that EA developers least wanted to work on in the history of systems at EA. However, according to Bernie Stolar, EA abandoned the Dreamcast over Sega's refusal to leave the sports game market and grant EA exclusive rights to the sports game genre on their platform. So how did this impact the Dreamcast? In 2000, the best-selling EA sports game on the PS1 was Madden 2001, with 990,000 units sold. On the PS2, it was Madden 2001, with 661,000 units sold. On the N64, a sports game didn't crack the top 10. The Dreamcast in comparison had the exclusive NFL 2K1, selling 901,791 units. The NFL 2K series was also receiving higher acclaim compared to Madden at the time, so while the EA situation may have impacted Sega to a small degree, I think it's clear when looking at the attach rate and sales data that it was negligible overall, and Sega's 2K series likely drove additional system sales. So to recap, did piracy kill the Dreamcast? I can say with 100% certainty that it didn't. The decline in revenue in other financial streams, over leveraging their assets in order to develop and launch the Dreamcast, and Sega's inability to hold out financially until the Dreamcast could turn the corner of profitability is ultimately what killed the Dreamcast. Special thanks to Mike Crow from Space Asylum and Ultra Healthy Video Game Nerd for helping translate documents for the purpose of this video. This is part of a compendium on Sega's successes and failures in the marketplace. If you're interested in learning more about Sega's success or why the exit of the console market, be sure to check out my video called Why Did Sega Fail? And until next time, thank you for watching Retro Impressions.